Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see so many people here interested in learning how to make their own herbal products to possibly give, a, give as gifts or have in your, your apothecary at your home. Okay. I'm a big fan of teaching people in the community how to make their own products. And I actually teach a community class. Uh, it's a five-week class called Simple Home Remedies. And I called it Simple Home Remedies because what you'll find when I'm teaching you how to make these products is that it's extremely easy to make your own products. I think over a time period, we've kind of gotten away from making our own medicinals, and we kind of start to go to the drugstore to get our salves or our creams or our syrups or our elixirs, um, and we kind of have let other people make them for us. But now what we're doing is we're like picking up these products and we're looking at the ingredients and we're saying, what is that? What is in my products? And then we start hearing from these like different consulting groups that are coming out and saying, well, some of these products, you know, the ingredients that they're putting in our products aren't really that great for us. Yeah. Um, and then when we start adding all those ingredients that are not so great for us on top of one another, it starts to become kind of a health risk. So what I appreciate about um, my journey in learning how to make my own herbal products is the fact that I have complete control over what I put in my products. I also have a better understanding of how to make the different products. Um, and something that, I, that just struck me when I was going through the herbal sciences program at Bastyr and taking this class myself, my herbal preparations class, I was like, wow, this isn't that hard. Like some things are a little challenging, but it's not really that hard to do. And the products I'm gonna show you how to make today, we're gonna to learn how to make a salve, we're gonna learn how to make a lip balm, and we're gonna learn how to make a body butter. Um, all of these products are probably the simplest to make, take the least amount of time, and are my favorite to give as gifts. Because you can make a lot of product to give to a lot of people for a little bit of money in a short amount of time. And you know, this is, this is the time of season where we're all like, oh my god, I don't have the time. And you think, I don't have the time to make something for people. You have, you have like maybe two hours of total prep time, and you can make gifts for all of your family members. And one year, my friend and I made a big gift basket for all of our friends that had lotions and creams and salves and facial scrubs and masks, and it was $7 per person. It's really cost effective. And we felt really good about what we were giving because we were giving something that we had made ourselves. So our love and our intention went into what we were making, and we felt really good because we were giving products to people that we felt would be good for them, right? So with that said, I'm gonna discuss how to actually incorporate herbs into some of these products. You can make a basic salve, which is using oil and beeswax, but why not make it more therapeutic, more nourishing to the skin, maybe have a specific focus on a specific condition by adding <coughs> herbs to it. And we are really fortunate in the Pacific Northwest to live in an area where herbs are all around us. I mean, you've probably got dandelions growing in your yard. You may curse them, but they're extremely helpful for us. You may have been hiking through the forest and come across or rubbed across stinging nettle, you know, and gotten that little sting, right? It's everywhere. Um, we have a number of really therapeutic herbs that grow around us. So we're in this position where we can go ahead and make our own medicinal products using what's around us. We also have a number of incredible um, apothecaries in the uh, Seattle and Kirkland area that if you're not going to go out and wildcraft the herbs yourself, you can go ahead and purchase those herbs. Um, so what I was saying at the beginning was I've given you a handout that gives you the instructions for how to make these. And generally I attach with that a recipe sheet that gives you different herbal combinations for different conditions like maybe psoriasis or eczema or maybe a bruise be gone or maybe a muscle rub. And um, I forgot to attach that. So my apologies. If you would like to receive that, just go ahead and email me and I'll go ahead and send you that attachment. Because it's really nice when you're st first starting to get to learn how to make these products, you're like, well, I don't know what herbs stick of mine. So it's an I, you know, it's a starting place to kind of give you an idea of where to go for. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and talk for about an hour. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and show you step by step how to make these preparations. We'll discuss some of the benefits of these preparations. Um, and then there's going to be a half an hour for question period. So 
Please hold your questions till the very end unless you have a question that specifically pertains to what I'm doing and it's something's not clear. That way I don't get derailed because that can easily happen. All you have to do is ask me about an herb and then we're talking about it for 30 minutes, okay? So, um, salves, lip balm, and vapor rubs, or not vapor rubs, body butters. So basically what we're doing when we're making a salve, a lip balm, or a body butter is we're taking what we call a fixed oil. And a fixed oil is basically any liquid or semi-solid oil um, that is not what we call an essential oil. So your olive oil, your safflower oil, your almond oil, your sesame oil, all of those are what we call a fixed oil. And we're taking that fixed oil and we're combining it with a solidifying agent. And that solidifying agent can be anything like beeswax or cocoa butter or shea butter or any number of the amazing butters out there like mango butter or a leafy butter. Um, and we're taking that fixed oil and we're making it into a solid form so that we can have a medicinal preparation that lasts over a period of time and easy, is easy to spread on the skin. So these preparations are definitely, they'll, even though they'll smell really good and they'll look really good, they're not for eating. <laughs> they're for topical application. Our salves tend to be a little bit more firmer in nature. You will often see a salve called an ungent or an ointment. And those we use for topical application, we could use a salve for a muscle rub, we could use a salve for eczema or psoriasis or rashes or stings or bites or bruises or strains or sprains or broken bones or any kind of trauma to the skin that we want to heal. There are a couple different conditions that I stay away from applying a salve to. If it is a deep puncture wound, I will stay away from applying a salve because with a deep puncture wound, generally you may have anaerobic bacteria that are living in that wound. And a salve is really good at providing this protective layer to the skin, kind of seals that wound off from the environment so it can uh, kind of keep uh, infection at bay and it can start the healing process. With a deep puncture wound, if you seal that, that wound off from the environment, all of a sudden you've cut off the oxygen to that wound. Any anaerobic bacteria that are living in that wound will then find the environment for them to thrive in. So you'll actually cause a deeper infection. So if it's a puncture wound, you know, you stepped on a tack, you got a giant sliver that embedded in your hand or stepped on a needle or something like that, a puncture wound that goes deep down, you a dog bite or a cat bite, you want to go ahead and stay away from using a salve. Also, if I'm dealing with a burn that reaches anything above really a first degree burn or more of a just a surface burn where there's a little bit of redness, anytime I go into there's blistering or even uh, the third degree burn where you have more of that blackening of the skin, completely stay away from a salve. Because what that's going to do is trap the heat in the tissues of the body. And what you want to do is release that heat. So that salve, think about it having that great protective nature sealing everything in, you actually want to stay away from a salve if you've got a more severe burn that's more of just a really, you know, ow, I touched the hot pot, I've got a little bit of redness. Then you can apply a salve, but anything deeper than that, I stay away from a salve. Our salves, our lip balms, and our body butters, really I think about having this ability to nourish our skin. And if we think about our skin, you know, it's really, like, we don't really think about our skin being an organ. We think about organs being like, you know, our heart or our kidneys or our liver. But our skin is actually the largest organ of our body. And it's responsible for so many different things. It helps actually keep the balance of water so that we can maintain the, the, the structure of our cells and maintain um, against water loss. It helps with detoxification. It's got a lot of purpose for us. And so we really need to think about nourishing our skin. And body butters are one of the better products that we can actually use, especially as we're going through this period of time where it's winter and it starts getting really, really cold. And if you like winter sports or if you like to spend a lot of time out in the cold, you'll start noticing that you might get wind chapped, where your skin is really, really dry because it's so cold outside and now we're in environments where we've got a lot of dry heat. So our skin gets really, really dry and it really wants us to moisturize it. So a body butter, whereas a salve is a little bit more protective, used for more of a condition-based scenario, a, a body butter really is all about nourishing the skin, feeding the skin. 
Our skin is made up of basically water, a lipid bilayer, vitamins, minerals, enzymes. And by actually applying body butters on topically, it really feeds the skin with those basic uh, components that it needs to be strong and healthy. So think about applying body butters to your skin every day to feed your skin. It needs to be fed, it needs to be nourished, right? And the same kind of goes for a lip balm. You know, think about our lips. Our lips are probably like the, the most sensitive skin of our body and they're completely exposed to the environment and are on our face, so it's what everybody sees, right? Um, and so our lip balms really help protect our lips against sun damage, against wind being wind chapped. You know, if you have a tendency to have kind of cracked uh, lips, uh, lip balm is really gonna be very useful in helping to keep your lips moisturized, helping to keep cold sores at bay. If you have a, a propensity cold sores, applying a good lip balm that maybe has some antiviral herbs into it can help keep those, uh, those cold sores at bay and really are very nourishing to the lips. So you're feeding the skin of your lips. Your lips should look nice and plump and juicy so that they look like they, you know, they love you. If they're dry and cracked, think about, huh, I should start applying lip balm to my lips to feed the skin of my lips, okay? So really these preparations I like to think about are all about loving your body, right? Um, and so what better gift to give somebody than a gift that says, here, I love you, love yourself, right? So our salves, like I said, traditionally called an ointment or an ungent. Really, our traditional salves, an ointment contains the least amount of solidifying agent. So an ointment will tend to be more like a pudding consistency. And oftentimes, I'll teach classes on how to make vapor rubs. Because we're in this time of the season when, you know, my mom, when I was a kid, if I got sick, slap on the Vicks vapor rub, right? like a layer, inch thick, under my nose, in my nose. Um, yeah, it's full of petroleum products. It's really easy to make your own Vicks Vapor Rub, right? I like to make my, my Vapor Rubs as an ointment. I like it to be almost a pudding consistency, so it's really easy to scoop out of the jar and it's really easy to apply topically. Our salves contain kind of a higher portion of our solidifying wax so that it's a little bit firmer in texture. And I'm gonna go ahead and send around this wound salve for everybody to test out. So go ahead and use your toothpick, scoop a little bit out, um, and apply it to any cuts, scrapes, bruises, anything you got going on right now with yourself. Um, so your salve is gonna be a little bit firmer in texture. Then we have what we call balms, which we kind of move into the lip balm uh, range and a lip balm is going to have the most amount of solidifying agent because if you've ever made your own lip balm and then you go out and you stick it in your pocket and it warms up and it melts on you and then you look down and you've got this big oil stain that will never come out you want your lip balm to be a little bit firmer so it really resists the melting okay so we talked about our salves being used for a number of different conditions that we want to use it topically. Really, they're, I, I mean, your salve is the thing that you want to have in your first aid kit. I always have a salve in my first aid kit. Uh, there's only a couple places that, you know, I kind of won't put a salve. And, you know, I, I nannied for like 14 years and I always wanted to have a salve in my car. Like I always had first aid kit in my car and I always wanted to put a salve in there because they're so useful for so many different things. But if you put a salve in the car, what happens is it heats up, it melts, it cools down, it resolidifies, it heats up, it melts, cools down, resolidifies, it gets all over your car, totally happens. Um, and then it goes rancid really quickly because it's being, it's going through this uh, temperature flux that just starts to change the, the molecules of the constituents and it goes rancid on you. So, you know, in the car, I, I kind of have gone away from putting my salves, but a salve is one of those things that is really just a basic thing to have in your first aid kit that you'll find extremely useful for so many different things. Oh, you know, my cat scratched me, salve. Oh, you know, I got a, I got a little minor burn, salve. Oh, I got a rash from something, salve, you know. My kid's got, you know, eczema, salve. Like, it just works for so many different things. Now, like I said, with a salve, you've got your basic uh, ingredients of a fixed oil, and then we're adding some sort of a solidifying agent. Typically, when I'm making a salve, I really like to use beeswax as my solidifying agent. 
And one of the reasons why I like to use beeswax as a solidifying agent, because the salves that I tend to make most generally for a first aid kit is what I call my wound healing salve. And my wound healing salve um, is really to help uh, prevent infection, to help support wound healing, right? And so beeswax is very antimicrobial in itself naturally. So it's part of the therapy of that salve because it has that antimicrobial nature. It'll actually resist infection. Um, if you were making a salve that was more like uh, something that was going to be more nourishing to the skin, then you might want to use something like cocoa butter or shea butter. When I'm making a salve, though, I have this, this really neat uh, way to kind of check the consistency of the salve. So it's really you cannot mess a salve up unless you don't have it on a high heat. <laughs> really, you cannot mess the salve up because if you're using beeswax at all points of making the salve, you can check the consistency by taking a, a spoon, you stick that spoon in the freezer, you let it get nice and cold, and then when you're ready to check the consistency of your salve, you just take that frozen spoon, you dip it into your mixture, it will harden on your spoon, and then you can go ahead and check the consistency. If your salve is too soft, you're going to want to add more of your solidifying agent. If it's too hard, you can add more oil. You really can't mess your salve up. You can continually check the consistency the entire time. If you use cocoa butter or shea butter, that trick doesn't work. So what you're left with is the kind of unknown. And I'm a big person when I'm making my medicines in my kitchen, and really this is basically you know kitchen medicine. When I'm making my medicines in my kitchen, I always have a lab notebook that I keep so that I can keep track of the ingredients, of the, the, you know, the procedure for how I made my different preparations. I can take notes about how it turned out. And this is really important if you want to make your salves with a butter or with a shea butter because you're, you're dependent on the, knowing what the consistency has turned out after it's already solidified. So after you've gone through the entire process. And so then you want to take notes, oh, didn't add enough of my solidifying agent, need to add more later, right? Um, typically, if I'm making a salve uh, with a butter, if I'm using shea butter, I will triple the amount of beeswax in that recipe. If I'm using cocoa butter, I will double the amount. And that's a good place to start with. Shea butter is a little bit softer than cocoa butter at room temperature. That's why I'm tripling the recipe. So, And then cocoa butter is really solid at room temperature. Not as solid as beeswax, though. So you need at least twice as much. Okay. Now, when you're making your salves, like I said, you've got a fixed oil and you've got your solidifying agent. Well, your fixed oil could just be olive oil or it could just be um, almond oil, but why not actually use an herbal infused oil, which is another really easy preparation to make. So with an herbal infused oil, what you simply need to do is take your jar that you're gonna be <laughs> digesting your oil in, soaking your herb in your oil in, and for herbs that are dry, and really fluffy, I add about a third of my jar full of my dried fluffy herbs. And then if I have herbs that are really fluffy like calendula, if you go, if you go to your herb store, if you buy calendula, you get these big beautiful whole calendulas, you put a third of your jar of calendula, you've got like three flowers in there, right? So what I like to do is actually you could reduce the volume of your herb by taking a coffee grinder or some an herb grinder and just buzzing it a couple times just to shrink the volume of that herb. You'll get a lot more herb in your oil. And what we want to do is try to force as much herb in our oil as we possibly can so we get a really strong medicinal oil, okay? But we have to keep in mind that with dried herbs, the fluffier they are, the more they go, are going to absorb your oil so that they rehydrate themselves, right? So if you started to go with a half full of calendula flowers, all of a sudden they're gonna absorb all of your oil, they're gonna puff up, and you're not gonna have enough oil covering your herb. And anytime we are taking a preparation and we are letting it soak, in its menstruum over a period of time, we need to make sure that an inch of our menstruum, our oil in this case, is covering our herb. If we don't have an inch covering our herb, what we do is we run the risk of that herb turning bad on us. 
being exposed, oxidating, and then going rancid, okay? When I'm making my infused oils, I almost always use dried herb. And when you're first starting out, dried herb is a little bit easier to work with. And the reason why is because water contained in your fresh herb does not like the oil that your menstruum is. Water and oil don't go together. And if there's water in your oil, it'll turn rancid fast on you. So there's a lot of extra steps to making a fresh infused oil. I've given you a couple different instructions on how to make a couple different uh, infused oils so that you can go ahead and start practicing how to make your own medicinal oil. My favorite is just doing what this is. This is called the long digestion method. Again, for dried herb that's really light and fluffy, a third full. For herb that is more dense, so roots, sparks, dried berries, dried seeds, you could get away with half full. And the reason why is those, the cell walls of those herbs are just a lot tougher. So it's not gonna absorb that much of your oil, okay? If you were making an infused oil with fresh herb, you can go all the way to two thirds because your fresh herb is not gonna absorb any of your oil. In fact, it's gonna give water to your menstruum, okay? But start out using your dried herbs, third full for light fluffy plant parts, half full with your uh, dried denser plant parts, and then you're gonna let it sit somewhere for about two weeks with the temperature set between 100 and 125 degrees. And this is what we call digesting our herb. We're digesting our herb in our oil. The golden rule whenever we're doing what we call a maceration or a digestion is about two weeks, right? That allows plenty of time for the oil to have contact with your herb so it can extract out those constituents from it, right? Our oil is gonna extract out any lipid soluble constituents from our plant material. And lipid solu soluble <laughs> plant constituents would be uh, obviously lipids, other lipids in that plant material, waxes, resins, flavonoids, alkaloids, and essential oils. So you can get a lot of different constituents being extracted out into your oil, making it a very medicinal oil. In my wound healing oil, the herbs that I generally like to use would be comfrey, Comfrey contains a constituent called lantoin that is actually helps with cell proliferation. So it helps to increase the production of cells in the tissues of the skin, in muscle fibers, in tendons, in bones. You've probably heard comfrey being called knit bone. It's so effective at doing that that you have to make sure the bone is set before you use comfrey because if you don't, comfrey will heal that bone so fast that it'll heal in its broken nature. So it's really good for surface wounds. I don't use comfrey on deep wounds because deep puncture wounds with comfrey, it heals from the top to the bottom. So again, it'll seal off that, that wound and you'll have this big wound and the anaerobic bacteria will have a little party and then you'll create a deeper infection. But it's extremely effective for a lot of topical traumas. So I love putting that in my wound healing uh, preparation. I also love calendula. Calendula is extremely antimicrobial. So it works for bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections, yeast infections. It's very, very antimicrobial. It also is what's called a vulnerary. So it actually helps to heal or speed up the wound healing time uh, for, that, for that wound. My other favorite herb that I pretty much put in almost every product nowadays is uh, go-to cola. Go-to cola helps with uh, increasing type one collagen formation. When you get a wound, your body immediately wants to start laying down uh, fiber, tissue. And what it's going to start laying down is what we call scar tissue. What you want to encourage it to do is lay down type one collagen, which is your natural tissue. You'll get a lot less scarring if you use go-to cola on your wounds extremely effective. It helps increase the tensile strength of the tissues, so how strong that tissue is, and it helps speed up the wound healing time. I also add plantain in. Plantain, also like comfrey, contains a lantoin. It's very cooling, it's very soothing, and plantain has this ability to draw out foreign objects from a wound. A sliver, a stinger, 
uh, any kind of gravel or anything left in that wound. It really has this drying ability. And it's also, like I said, very cooling and very moisturizing. Rose is used in a lot of cosmetics because rose has a lot of tannins in it. And that tannin content helps to astringe the tissues. It helps to tighten and tone the tissues. Very effective at doing that. And then I like to add yarrow because yarrow is your all-purpose wound healing herb. Yarrow is effective for so many different wounds. It's what we call a styptic, so it'll stop or slow uh, bleeding. It is very high in tannin, so it'll actually help to tighten and tone the tissues and help increase uh, wound healing. And it's extremely antimicrobial. Lots of volatile oils in there, so it'll actually help to uh, decrease infection. It's one of our better first aid herbs that we have. So in my wound healing oil, those are the herbs that we're gonna find. Now, that's just a really nice basic salve to have in your first aid kit, because you can use it for a number of different conditions and it'll suit so many different conditions. You can also make just a basic calendula salve. That's probably one of the most basic ones to make. And if you don't have the time to make your own infused oil, you could go to your local herb store, and most all local herb stores will have an already infused calendula oil for you to purchase. Or a St. John's wort infused oil to purchase. And St. John's wort is an excellent first aid herb that's useful for any kind of topical wounds or traumas, specifically if it has like a nerve-related issue with it, so if there's a lot of nerve pain, okay? So you can buy your own infused oil or you can make your infused oil. Question about the um, keeping it at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Where in Seattle would that be? <laughs> Next to your stove, okay. on top of your radiator or your heating ducts, in a water bath, in a yogurt maker, in a crock pot, um, in your oven with just the pilot light on if you have a gas oven, in your oven with just the, the light on uh, if you have a regular electric oven. All of those are good places. Uh, I literally stick mine on the heating vent and it works really well. You know, people are like, well, it'll get, it won't get as hot because you know my heating vent only keeps my house at 70 degrees, but it's that constant heat that's running through this small vessel that totally heats up. So it works really, really well. If you have a wood stove, don't put it on the wood stove because then it'll get way too hot, but put it next to the wood stove. And that works great. Yes, we live in Seattle. We don't, you know, even in the summertime, it can be challenging to make your infused oils in the summer. It's a good question. So when we're making our salve, uh, we have this general rule. It's about a cup of oil to an ounce of beeswax. Now, your amount of solidifying agent might change during the different seasons. So in the summertime, when the heat is kind of softening and melt melting our salves, you might want to add a little more than an ounce to make sure that it's a little bit more solid in the summer. In the winter, when it's cooler, um, you might want to add a little less than an ounce of beeswax because in the winter time, it's going to be cool outside. So that salve is going to harden up. And what you don't want to do is have to get a chisel out to get your salve out of your jar, right? So maybe a little less than an ounce during the winter time. I generally just use an ounce and I actually like that consistency. If I, if I were living in a really hot climate or if I were traveling to a really hot climate, then I would probably use a little bit more than an ounce in the summertime. I was just wondering, it's one cup of oil to one ounce? Yes, and you'll find that actually in your instructions on how to make okay. your salve. Okay. You can also make what we call a large batch salve that you can individually create different therapeutic salves for different people. And the basic one to do is to make a large batch of calendula salve. And you're going to make that hard. You know, hard enough where you can still scoop it out of the, the jar to blend in, but pretty solid because what you're gonna do is add other ingredients to that salve. You might add some tinctures. You might add other infused oils. You might mix in essential oils. You're gonna be mixing in other liquid components to that salve and it's gonna soften up quite a bit. So you want a harder base salve so that you can mix into. 
This works really great if you, uh, you know, work in a clinic or, you know, your your family, you know, you're the family herbalist or you're the community herbalist. You have people coming to you saying, well, my kid's got a diaper rash, or you've got somebody that says, oh, but I've got, you know, a fungal infection, or you've got somebody that comes to you and says, oh, I need something just for basic wound healing. You could actually add in different ingredients to this base calendula salve and kind of make an individual salve for different people. The shelf life of our salves, generally one to two years. Uh, again, you're basically not adding any water ingredients to your salve. So um, with the absence of water, salves last for a pretty good amount of time. The best time, uh, type of containers to put your salves in are these nice dark uh, glass containers. Pretty easy to find on the market. <coughs> if you're going to pour it into a bigger jar, just make sure you keep it out of direct heat, direct light. You want to keep it somewhere in a nice, cool area without a lot of heat. How can you tell when it's um, gone beyond the... It'll smell weird. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever, you know, every time you make any kind of preparation, I tell people, use your organoleptic senses. This is your ability to smell something, taste something, hear something, touch something. Really, we're using smell and... Uh, taste a lot. And so you want to smell your products when you first make them and you know what they smell like when they're first made. That way, over a period of time, you pick it up and you smell it and you're like, oh, that, if, if the question in your mind comes up that does that, that doesn't smell the same, does it? It's gone bad, right? And then it's time to compost it. Now we can increase the shelf life of our salves by adding essential oils. All essential oils are antimicrobial. Some are more specific. You've probably heard of tea tree for fungal infections, yarrow and, and uh, blue chamomile for uh, fighting any kind of topical bacterial infections. But all essential oils are antimicrobial. So essential oils extend the, the life of your salves, but essential oils are also therapeutic, right? So I like to add essential oils to my wound healing salve, and some of my favorites are lavender. I mean, lavender is a medicine chest in itself. And probably right up with lavender, and maybe even a little bit above lavender, dare I say, <laughs> is helichrysum. If you haven't experienced helichrysum, this is an essential oil that should be in everybody's first aid kit or in their first aid salve. It's so effective against burns, against scars, against rashes, against different skin conditions like eczema, psoriasis. Do you mind to spill it, please, or to write it down? Sure. Um, I can write it. So a very effective herb to add, or a very effective essential oil to add to your first, to your uh, wound healing salve. And then yarrow and blue chamomile, two of the better anti-infective wound healing essential oils we have. Now, I also really love to add lavender because lavender has a calming fragrance. And I work a lot with kids and kids first aid, you know, and even adults are like this. So there's some kids that if they get wounded, they do not want to be touched. They don't want you to help them. They don't want you to touch their boo-boo. Don't put anything on, right? Um, that scent of the lavender in the salve can be very calming to the person. Hey, just smell this for a second. Does that smell good? And they're like, yeah, yeah. We should put a little bit on your wound, don't you think so? Okay. People are even like that. So think about your, your essential oils really having three different uh, properties. One is it increases the shelf life of your salve. Two is that it actually helps with the therapeutic benefits of your salve. And three is it can have an emotional um, aspect too. Calming or invigorating, right? You can make a foot salve. You know, and put peppermint in there. If you get tired feet, work retail, and you get really tired feet, and they hurt and ache, peppermint on the feet, oh my goodness. Like, wakes up your feet, really, really nice. So think about that. You can also add a little vitamin E. Vitamin E is a, is a very good antioxidant. So it's very helpful in helping to increase the shelf life 
of your preparation. And also, you know, depending on what research you look at, some people say it has absolutely no effect on wound healing, but I believe differently because I've seen its effects on wound healing. So uh, vitamin E is very effective at, at increasing the wound healing time of, of, of wounds as well. Okay, so now on to how do you make a salve? So it's as easy as taking a cup of your infused oil and putting it in a water bath. Now my favorite water bath to use is actually just a pan filled with a little bit of water. You don't want the water to come up too high on your measuring cup because if it starts to boil really rapidly and then it starts to splash in your measuring cup, you've now added water into your salve and wah wah, not good. I like to use a measuring cup because then I have my vessel that I can pour from. I don't have to pour it into something else to pour it with, right? So I like the measuring cup, but you can also just set a bowl on top to create that double boiler. In my measuring cup, I went ahead and put one cup of my infused wound healing oil, and I put one ounce of my beeswax. Beeswax can be really tough to work with. Uh, what you want to keep in mind with beeswax, the most troublesome part of this whole thing is waiting for the beeswax to melt. Was that beeswax that you poured in front of It the was, plant? absolutely. It was like, it was like little pieces. Yep, I'm going to talk about that right now. So the beeswax, the smaller the pieces are, the, quick, the more quickly it will melt. I like to get beeswax in those nice big bricks, and then I stick it in my freezer, and I let it completely harden, and then I put it in a couple... Uh, Ziploc bags and then I wrap it with a towel and then I take it outside and put it on a nice solid surface and then I take a hammer and if I've got any aggravations in my life take it out on the beeswax and get it so that it shatters because basically it'll shatter and you can shatter it into nice small pieces. You can also grate your beeswax using a cheese grater. Keep in mind that your cheese grater will never be used for cheese again. <laughs> it's your beeswax grater, and that's all it will ever be used for. Because once you get beeswax on something, it just stays there. So don't use your nice knives to cut up your beeswax, because you'll ruin them. All right? Now, grating it, you get these nice little curls, and those are easy to work with. You can also buy beeswax pellets. Now, keep in mind that beeswax pellets have been processed a little more than the regular beeswax. So even though you're not putting through the, forth the effort, you might lose some properties to beeswax during that processing period. Who knows? Nobody's done studies to see if there's you know, properties lost. So once my beeswax is melted, and again, that takes the most amount of time. That's why I already started the melting process, because if I edit it right now, it wouldn't be done by the time I was done talking. If I wanted to check that consistency, I would go to my freezer, open the door, take out my spoon, dip it in, let it solidify, and then check the consistency of it. So let's say I've done that, and I love the consistency of my salve. I'm gonna go ahead and take it out of my pan. I like to go ahead and wipe any moisture off of the bottom of my cup, because what you don't wanna do while you're pouring your salve into your jar is get water in it, right? And then I'm gonna add my essential oil. To this one, I'm gonna la add lavender. The general amount of essential oil to add to your preparation is about 10 drops per ounce. I've got eight ounces, so I'm gonna need about 80 drops. That's gonna give you a really good therapeutic salve. If you just want it to have a little bit more of a preserving property, but you don't want it to smell so strong, add less, maybe about five drops of essential oil per ounce. What medicated oil are you using? This was my all wound purpose oil. So the one I described to you. We'll call that about 80. Now, the oils you use are also going to increase the therapeutic properties of your salve, your basic fixed oil. I will have to say when I'm making a good anti-infective 
salve or something that's all-purpose wound healing, my favorite oil to use is castor oil. Castor oil is extremely anti-inflammatory. It moves congestion. It's been known to break up fibrous tissue, tumors, really, really effective. Extremely thick and viscous. So I actually like to cut my castor in half. So for my cup of oil, I would use a half a cup of castor, and then I like to use a half a cup of grapeseed oil, because grapeseed oil is the lightest oil, most readily absorbed into the skin. Very effective. What uh, type of essential oil would you use uh, for like an allergic reaction, like welts or? Um, I would use either lavender or helichrysum. They, I find lavender be, to be extremely good for any kind of bites or itches or nervy, scratchy related things. Oh, so helichrysum. There you go. Try that one. Very effective. So once you've added your um, your essential oil, and you'll notice I added my essential oil off heat. And the reason why is because essential oils are volatile. You'll often hear essential oils called volatile oils. If you add them to your mixture as it's sitting, you'll start smelling it in the air. All of that essential oil is now in the air and it's actually not in your salve anymore. So it's the last thing I do is add my essential oil and then I'm gonna pour my mixture into my jar. Now when I do this at home, I like to actually let it go ahead and cool with the cap off. Um, if you let it cool with the cap on, what you'll notice is condensation kind of starts to gather at the top. Not a big deal. I'm not going to want to let it cool sitting here when I'm working around and I don't want to spill salve all over these nice people. So if you are cooling it with the cap on, just make sure you take that cap off after it's completely solidified and wipe the condensation off the top. And then what I like to do is label it. So when I'm labeling my preparations, I always put the name of my preparation, so wound healing salve. I put the ingredients in there. That's very good because what you want to make sure is if somebody goes into your first aid you know, cabinet, your medicine cabinet, and picks up your salve, if you know they're allergic to an ingredient in there, they'll know because it's on there. And then the date. And the date helps you to be able to see, well, how long did it last? You know, I can't tell you how many times I'll actually look into my refrigerator and I'll find a preparation that doesn't have a date. I'm like, how, when did I make this? Or if I don't have a label on it, it's like, what is this? <laughs> how long has it been around for? What's in it? Like, I have no idea. So that's what I usually like to add to my label. Now your salve is done. Now let's say you want to play, you know, Christmas Elf, and you've got like 10 different people that you want to make salves for. It's really easy to make your base salve. Oh, I knew I was going to do this. To make your base salve, and then to go ahead and to go ahead and um, individually scent your different products. So you could do that by simply setting up all your little jars and then putting your drops of essential oil into your jar. And then when you're ready, pour your salve into it. What I like to do is pour it halfway, take my favorite kitchen utensil for my medicine making, which is the chopstick. <laughs> Go ahead and, I, I use this for everything. I love these things. Stir your salve to make sure all your essential oil is blended and then go ahead and pour it up to the top. And then that way you can make 20, 30, 40, however many different scents for different people that you want, but you've only made one base salve, right? So wow, how easy is that? How easy was this? You got oil, you've got beeswax, you let it melt, you pour it in jars, you're done. You've just made like a million gifts, you know? It cost you like three bucks. Will it stay that color once it sets a little bit? Yes, it'll have that kind of goldeny, greeny color, which you saw with that salve that I was handing out. Now you saw me go ahead and pour more of the salve back into my jar. I always do this. So one of the things that's awesome about gift making is not only can you make a salve, but you can also make a lip balm. And guess what a lip balm is? a salve that has been solidified a little bit more. So you can make two preparations in making a salve. All you have to do is reserve some of your salve mixture. So I usually reserve about a quarter cup of my salve mixture. 
you know, and your lips want the wound healing properties of those herbs, the collagen. You know, as we age, our collagen starts to kind of go on us. So increasing that collagen health. Um, your lips are gonna love all those herbs in your wound healing. Now, if I was making like an anti-infective salve that had like, you know, black walnut and a whole bunch of like weird herbs in it, I might not wanna change that into a lip balm, but for the wound healing or just a basic calendula salve, totally great lip balm. So it's easy to make two gifts in one time. Reserve about a quarter cup of your salve mixture. And to that, I like to add some cocoa butter and or some shea butter. And I add about two tablespoons total. So you can easily add a tablespoon of cocoa butter and a tablespoon of shea butter. Shea butter can be a little tricky to work with. I don't know if you've worked with shea butter. Here's a lip balm, so you're gonna use one of your handy dandy, uh, you know. <laughs> toothpick. Toothpick, thank you, that's where I was like, matchstick, that's not right. Uh, toothpick to scrape that out. Uh, Shea butter can be a little tricky to work with. You have to, I've heard, you know, you either have to not heat it up very much at all or heat it up to a certain temperature. Um, if you don't, what will happen is it actually will kind of solidify at a different rate and you'll get these little, uh, what I call moisturizing beads <laughs> in your salve or in your body butter or in your lip balm. So cocoa butter sometimes is just a little bit easier to work with. I don't find that happening with cocoa butter. so. I'm gonna go ahead and add my cocoa butter into my salve mixture. And then I actually also like to add a little bit more I forgot to bring it. A little bit more beeswax. So I'll generally add just about, you know, uh, seven ounces more beeswax uh, to make it a little bit more solid. So you've already got your salve mixture, then you're gonna add a little bit more beeswax and maybe some cocoa butter and shea butter. Now with your lip balms, you can get really creative. Remember your lips are being exposed to the sun, which is out, you know, even if it's under clouds in Seattle, it's still there, right? So UV protected herbs, uh, St. John's wort is one of our better UV protected herbs. Topically, it works great as a sunblock. So, Adding a little St. John's wort oil to your lip balm will actually help with that UV protectant. You could add herbs that we call corrigent herbs, herbs that have a flavor, you know, lip smackers. When I was a kid, we had those big tubes of, you know, cherry flavored lip smacker. So you can make your own, you know, using essential oils. So orange essential oil, lemongrass essential oil, uh, there's cocoa essential oil, there's vanilla essential oil. You can make a really nice, flavored lip balm, stimulating herbs to stimulate your lips. So any of the mints, you could add a pinch of cayenne pepper. And when I say a pinch of cayenne pepper, I mean a pinch of cayenne pepper. <laughs> but if you're looking, if you spend, you know, big bucks for a tube of lip plumper, you can make your own. And cayenne pepper definitely works as a lip pump plumper. What you wanna make sure you do is don't keep applying it all day long because if you apply too much of the cayenne to the lips, all of a sudden you'll burn the lips, not good. But a little bit actually has a very nice lip plumping capacity. Honey is really nice to add. Honey is antimicrobial, it tastes nice, it's a humectant, so it draws moisture from the air and infuses it into your lips. Very good for, for nourishing the lips. Um, you could add coloring agents. So if you want a colored, uh, lip balm, you can get mica powders. Uh, Herbs of Grace is our local company that makes colored mica pe uh, powders. They're from Mossy Rock, Washington. The beautiful colors. You can make your own lipstick. What is, what is lipstick? It is a solid lip balm that's had weird stuff added to make it colored, right? You can make your own using colored mica. You can also use beet powder. I will caution, do not use beet powder and honey in the same preparation. I don't know what it is with those two, but they totally like react weird and you get this ball of like beet powder and honey that will not dissolve. It's totally bizarre. So you could add beet powder. You could add, add a, a, an herb called alkanet root. And you simply take that alkanet root and you actually uh, put it in your oil, let it sit for an hour. Your oil turns this gorgeous deep red color you strain it out, use that alkanut uh, 
the alkanet root tinted, I mean, it makes a, it makes a lip tint. So it's gonna actually kind of tint your lips a little bit, but it's not like the mica. It's not gonna actually color, it's not like lipstick. Now, if you wanna make a lip gloss, simply use castor as your base. And so my all-purpose wound healing oil is in a base of castor and grapeseed. So what I'm gonna make is what we call a lip gloss. Castor oil is used in the cosmetics industry, in a lot of cosmetics, because it makes things shiny. So all lip glosses generally have a base of castor oil to it. So if you're making your salve, you could reserve that quarter cup. If you want to make a base lip balm, you simply add a quarter cup of your fixed oil with eight ounces of beeswax. And then you're going to add about a quarter an ounce of beeswax at a time until you get that consistency that you're looking for. You want it to be more firm. Uh, as far as containers, is there a, how, how do you find a container and then use it if you're wanting it in? Yeah. Like you normally would use for lipstick. Yeah. So, um, ooh, lipstick containers. That's a good question. Um, I might try Xena Supply. They're a great place for containers. I don't actually don't buy any of my ingredients from Zenith Supply because they, I'm all, I, I want my ingredients to be very, you know, basic, organic, I'm making therapeutic property products. Um, so that might be a place to try. I personally like the lip tins. Um, that's what I really like to use. Uh, so you can get lip tins at, um, at, at Zenith Supply would have those. I would also check Seattle Bottle Works and see what they have. They have a number of different containers, and there are there are like local uh, container company. Are they online? Yes. Say that again. Zenith. So Z E N I T H. Um. So you're gonna go ahead and let your cocoa butter, your shea butter, your beeswax all go ahead and uh, melt in your oil. And we'll let that do that. And then you'll pour it into its containers. And it's, it's as easy, that's as easy as making a lip balm. Now, if you're using chapstick containers, they always can be really challenging to fill, right? You could actually get what's called a chapstick. It's, it's this big plastic block, and it's got little holes in it that you could put your chapstick containers in. And it sets like that, so it'll all set up nice and easy, and then you can pour your chapstick. Now, with, when filling your chapstick containers, you want to make sure that it's got a nice little dome of oil. It almost looks like it's ready to spill over because as your salve cools, it will condense. And if you don't have that little bump on the top, that little dome, it'll shrink too much and you'll get this divot. And then sometimes it won't roll up quite right. So with those nice little, uh, what salve making, you know, uh, blocks, they actually have it so that there's about a good inch of space between the top of the salve container and the top of that plastic so that actually you get that dome and you don't have to worry about it spilling all over your counter. Here's one of the aspects that you want to keep in mind when making your salves and your lip balms. If you've used beeswax, like I said, beeswax gets over everything and then it's coated in beeswax. The best way to clean up after making a salve and making your lip balms is to completely wipe your containers, your utensils, anything that's come in contact with that liquid beeswax, completely wipe it out with paper towels, compost the paper towels, and then wash your utensils. If you don't wipe it out with paper, to with, uh, paper towels, what you're going to get is a sink full of beeswax. Your sponge is going to be full of beeswax. Don't put it in your dishwasher because your dishwasher is going to be full of beeswax. So you want to completely wipe everything out first, get all that beeswax off, then wash it with soap and water. Okay? So my lip balm is done. I'm going to add some essential oil to my lip balm, a little cocoa cardamom lip balm maybe. So I got a quarter of an ounce, and I'm going to add a little bit less. I'm going to add about five drops um, per ounce. because I just want it to be nice and lightly fragranced. Essential oils, you want to definitely make sure that they are um, diluted before you put on the skin. There are some you could use neat, but not many. And the lips are really sensitive, so you don't want to get a whole lot of essential oil on the lips. 
Again, I'm gonna pour my lip balm in my lip balm containers. Now you've made a salve and you've made a lip balm. You've got two gifts to give somebody. They don't know that it took you like an hour to make both gifts and that it took hardly any real effort. And they're gonna be incredibly grateful. They're gonna be like, oh my God, you made this for me? Wow. Now the last thing I'm gonna cover is body butters. So again, I was talking about our skin being the largest organ of our body, really wanting to be nourished. Body butters is one of the better things we can make. A cream is also an incredible thing to make, and I do teach classes on how to make a cream. It's one of the more challenging preparations to make, but really it's giving your body all of the essential nutrients it needs to stay healthy. A body butter is easy though because you're not adding the water ingredients, so you don't ever really have to worry about your body butter going off on you, and that is very challenging with a cream. Anytime you've added water into a preparation, you've got to think preservatives because it's got a shorter shelf life. With a body butter, you don't really have that issue. So I'm gonna send this one around. Let's we'll start with this end. This is a whipped body butter. And a body butter is really very similar to making a salve. And what we're using with our, what we're, what we're using, the ingredients we're using when we're making a body butter is simply a fixed oil and a butter, right? So you could use any butter. Cocoa butter, shea butter, mango butter, leafy butter, uh, cocum butter, you know, lots of different types of butters. They all have their own therapeutic value to it. You can make your infused oil, the, the fixed oil you use, it can be a medicinal oil. I'm using um, sweet almond oil to mix in. And basically you're looking for about 75% butter content to about 25% of your fixed oil. So what we're simply doing is melting down our butter and then adding a small amount of our fixed oil to kind of thin it out a little bit so it's not so solid at room temperature. A body butter, ridiculously easy to make, right? So I went ahead and I melted down my cocoa butter at the beginning of the class. I'm gonna go ahead and take this off the heat. And I will tell you what, body butters on the market are very expensive. Shea butter to buy on the market, like if you go to your, uh, this is one of those things that I would not buy from my local herb store. It's like $20 for a tiny jar, right? Mountain Rose Herbs, buy your medicine making ingredients from them. They're awesome, they're basically local, they're in Portland, or not in Portland, they're in uh, Pleasantville, or. Yeah, it's Mountain Rose Herbs. Um, they are very mindful about where they get their products. They only contain, you know, they only sell really good high quality. So if you go onto their website and you look up shea butter, they'll tell you exactly how the shea butter was processed, whether it's fair trade, whether it's organic. So you got a lot of information behind the products that you're purchasing, which is a little challenging when you go to a store and you just pick up something and you're like, well, I don't know, where does this come from? Who's this benefit, you know? So I like them for buying my, my ingredients. And you get a large amount of shea butter or a large amount of bagel butter for not as much as you would buy from one of your smaller herb stores. It's just how it is. Um, so I went ahead and melted down my cocoa butter and then I'm gonna go ahead and add in my body butter. So for my cocoa butter, I had just about, uh, I wrote this down. I had 150 grams of my cocoa butter. And then I had 50 mils of my sweet almond oil. And I'm just gonna add that sweet almond oil to my cocoa butter once I take it off heat. Stir it in. And then I'm gonna add my essential oils. Remember, we're adding our essential oils off heat. So to this one, I'm gonna add some ylang ylang and some lime. Okay. 
Now, you could easily make what we call a whipped body butter. taking your butter and letting it solidify just like a salve or you can make what's called a whipped body butter so you'll notice what I'm sending around is what we call a whipped body butter a whipped body butter is basically mixing with a hand blender your oils and so the way that you do that is you would go ahead and take your container and put it in the freezer and usually it's about five minutes in the freezer take it out blend it put it back in the freezer for five minutes take it out blend it I usually like to just put it in the freezer until it gets semi-solid in nature. Then take it out and you blend it with just like a hand blender or with a mixer. And you'll notice it'll start to like totally like making whipped cream. It totally like starts to lighten up and froth up. So you're forcing air into the oil. You get a lighter, more kind of airy mixture that's really easy to apply topically. It looks really pretty. Is it more therapeutic than a regular body butter that's just been cooled regular? No. But, you know, it's fancier. Here, are, here's my whipped body butter that I made you, right? You could charge a lot more for a whipped body butter. So you're gonna go ahead and put it in your container to cool. And then it's as easy as that. So as you're making your salve for your gifts, Again, you're going to make your salve. You're going to reserve some of that salve to make it for your lip balm. You're going to have your body butter melting down at the same time. This is like one afternoon. You can make a lot of gifts. They're heartfelt. They came from you. You know exactly what's in it. The people know exactly what's in it. They're really wonderful gifts to give. And I, I think that gifts that, when you give gifts that you've made, you feel really good about it, and the people feel really good about receiving it. Right? Because you put a lot of thought and effort into it. It's not just a gift card to somewhere. It's not like cash. Here, I didn't know what to give you. Here's some cash. Right? <laughs> so this is a good time for questions. I want to actually, really quick, right before we get into the questions, let you know that in the wintertime and in the summertime at Bastyr University, there is a class that I teach called Medicine Making for All. It is open to the public, so you can take that class. I have a number of community members that take it. In the spring, and I'm just about ready to set up the class dates, and in the fall, I teach a five-week medicine-making course at Dandelion Botanical. If you go to my website, you can go ahead and see all of the classes that I teach uh, in community format. If you want me to come and teach you how to make preparations independently, I also do that. Or if you want to get a group of people to have me come and teach you how to make preparations, I will also do that. So we could do a private medicine-making lesson at your home. So those are all open if you're interested in learning how to make a number of different products that might be something you're interested in. Questions? So when you do your own oil and you've had it at 100 degrees for two weeks, yep. how much oil do you actually get out of that container? You're gonna, how do you strain it out? Yeah, so straining your oil out, I simply like to go ahead and take a vessel, like a measuring cup, set a fine um, mesh strainer in it, Go ahead and line that with cheesecloth, pour my oil over it, let it completely drain, pick it up and squeeze as much oil out of the herb as possible. And then you're done. Um, you recommended the um, this Mount Rose for shea butter. How yes. about beeswax locally yep. and all those other? Beeswax, you could actually go, if you go to the farmer's markets, a lot of the people that sell honey yeah. have beeswax and they want to get rid of it. So it's a great source for local uh, beeswax. I feel like there was a question in the back corner, yes? Yeah, so you said you have to heat it to like 100 or 125. Yep. You say it has to be heated for two weeks? Yep. Do you just use like a hot plate? Would that work if you just kept it on a hot plate for two weeks? Um, so there's, there's I, if you're at home and you can monitor the hot plate, yeah. uh, a crock pot, cro you can find crock pots at Goodwill stores, thrift stores, they're everywhere. Here's the thing with crock pots. The newer ones have a low, medium, high setting. The low setting is above 125 degrees. So what I do is I go in and raise the crock up um, off the heating element, put a couple rocks under there, and then go ahead and do my oil in there. And it's really easy. You don't have to worry about burning down the house. But 
but if you were at home, you could just put it in a water bath on the stove and keep it at a certain temperature. And then once you left for that for the day, just turn it off. Then come back and turn it back on and keep up that that rhythm of doing that. So totally fine to do it that way. So if you're doing if you're doing that, then you're not getting two weeks at that temperature. Do you have to do it? Do you have to do it longer then? Um, you know, the temperature fluctuation is going to be a little, it's not going to be so much, you're not going to lose so much heat, you're still going to have a good digestion. You are going to really know that your medicinal oil has, is, is of a good quality once it takes on that color and the scent of that plant material. You can also do what's called a quick method. So let's say you didn't have two weeks, but you wanted to make a specific infused oil and you wanted to make a preparation that day. You do what's called the quick boiler method. And so that's as simple as setting up your double boiler, putting your herb in, covering it with oil, and letting that sit at 125 degrees for at least two hours. Rosemary Gladstar recommends about 30 minutes. I just don't find that I get a good enough extraction. I want to do it for at least two hours. And keeping it at that really high temperature, 125 degrees, you'll see your oil take on the color of your herb. And it should smell, have that smell of your, if your herb has a smell. Now, if it doesn't, don't expect your oil to smell any different. But, yeah, so you can do that quick boiler method, and that's a good quick way to do it. That's the one on page three? Yeah. It's probably understood that it's yeah, so the fixed oil, again, is any liquid oil that's not an essential oil. Olive oil, canola oil, sesame oil, walnut oil, you know, any of those oils. So the ones that are typically used a little bit more, what I use more is going to be sweet almond oil, olive oil, grapeseed oil, and then like I said, I really like to use castor oil for any wound salves I'm making, and I cut that half and half castor and, um, and uh, grapeseed oil. You could also use jojoba oil. Jojoba oil is one of the better things we can use on our body. It's actually a liquid wax. Um, it's the most like our natural oil. The thing with jojoba oils is just really expensive to get, so. Candy thermometer, meat thermometer, something like that works just great. Only when you're making your long digested oil, if you really wanted to watch that temperature, if you were doing it in a crock pot, you go ahead and put it in the oil. You just want to make sure the heating element's not touching the bottom so that you're getting a true measure of the oil itself. And if you're doing it in like two hour method, mm -hmm. you put it in the Yep, put it in there the entire time to make sure you've got it at that higher range. What's, um, what essential oil combination is in that whipped body butter that's going on? I had a friend make that, I'm not sure. Oh. So it does, doesn't it? I know. Yeah, it's something. Yeah. I would say that she might not have used essential, like she might have used more of a perfume oil on that than an essential oil. Because it has that hyacinthy lilac, which you're just not going to find as essential oil. But it smells good. Have you ever used coconut oil as your fixed oil? Yes, now the thing with coconut oil is once it's done being liquid and you let it cool at room temperature, your coconut oil is now a salve. So you've kind of made almost an ointment using coconut oil. Um, I also really love avocado oil. The thing with avocado oil is if you get really good avocado oil that is green and smells like avocados, you have to keep it in the refrigerator to keep it from spoiling. So you need to keep your infused avocado oil in the refrigerator and you've basically made a sap, right? So speaking of oil, how do you know what kind of olive oil? There's cold press, there's medium, there's This is a light, great question. So the the... You know, you're making your own preparations at home. You want to make sure you're making good therapeutic preparations that are not toxic for you. Plants have an ability to absorb the toxins that are put on them. So when they're expressed to make an oil, if it's been, you know, if there's toxins that have been used on that plant, it's going to be included in your oil. The more it's refined, the less the therapeutic quality it is. And they do, they do, they do different things. Uh, they do. Um, heat fluctuations, they do cold fluctuations, uh, they put it through a lot. The more it's been processed, the least therapeutic it's going to be. So when I'm buying a oil, I'm looking for cold pressed or unrefined. Unrefined is going to be the strongest.
strong is most therapeutic, and cold press is gonna be the second. Anything that goes beyond those two, you're probably getting an oil that doesn't smell like anything, right? Your oil should smell like the plant it came from. It should taste like the plant it came from. If it doesn't, it's probably been over-processed, then you're losing all the therapeutic properties of that oil, all the nutritive qualities. Tea is easy. Tea you don't have to worry about because you're using water. You don't have to worry about it. It's just when you're making a oil that you have to worry about that water content in that herb. But the tea, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I have like more. If you're using peppermint, make sure you cover the vessel. And you're just going to want to pour hot water over your herb, cover the vessel, um, and let it steep for about 15 minutes. And about a tablespoon of herb for dried herb and three tablespoons of fresh herb per cup of water to get a really medicinal tea. Okay. Yeah. If you're making your oils with fresh herb, since we've got a minute, I can discuss this. If you're making your oils with fresh herb, and you totally can, there's, there's no reason why you can't make it. If you're making a chickweed infused oil, and chickweed is so good for topical issues like eczema and psoriasis, one of the better herbs to use for that, um, it's totally no good dried. Chickweed dried, don't buy it, don't waste your money on it. You have to use it fresh. It contains a lot of water, right? So when making an oil with an herb that's fresh, there's a couple things that you can do to make sure that you uh, get that water out of the oil. One is wilt your herb for about 12 to 24 hours. That means clip your herb. Don't harvest it on a day when it's raining outside, right? Clip your herb, go ahead and um, hang it upside down or lay it out nice and even on a surface that gets good airflow and let it wilt. That um, helps to evaporate some of the water off of it. Put it in your oil and then make sure that you are constantly checking your oil every day. I find that when you're making an herb, uh, when you're making an oil with fresh herb, the double boiler method is the best method. And the reason why is because you'll notice as you're making your oil with your fresh herb and you've got it at 125 degrees, it'll start to bubble on you. Well, you know it's not boiling, right? You don't want to cook your oils. You don't want your, your kitchen to smell like cookies when you're making your infused oils, right? Um, but you want it at that 125 degrees and you'll notice it'll start to bubble on you. And what's happening is all that water that is in that fresh herb is being evaporated off. When it's done bubbling, the water's gone. The hardest thing to do when you do the long digestion method is uh, to, to ensure that it doesn't start to go bad on you, that it doesn't have bacterial growth. So if you wanna do the long digestion method with fresh herb, every day that you are letting your, mat, your digestion soak, you want to go to it every day and shake it, right? Because you notice all my herb was sitting at the bottom of the jar, right? So you want to shake it. And this is with any preparation that you're making and you're letting your herb soak in your, your menstruum. You want to go to it every day and you want to shake it. I always say shake your love and joy and good intentions into your medicine. Don't go and shake it with anger, right? Because your good loving energy goes into your medicine. It makes stronger medicine. It just does. Um, you're going to shake it. That way you ensure that all of your menstruum is in contact with all of your herb all the time so you get a better constituent extraction. If you just let it sit there and that herb's sitting down there, there's a bunch of herb that's just not in contact with the oil. So every day you wanna shake it. If you're making your long digested uh, oil with fresh herb, before you shake it, look at it. If it's got little bubbles rising, guess what? It's begun to ferment. And you can arrest fermentation. And the way that you do that is you quickly heat your oil up to 150 degrees and then bring it back down to 125 degrees. By bringing it up to 150 degrees, it kills the bacteria, but it doesn't kill your oil. The reason why we have it at 100 and 125 degrees is anything below 100 degrees is just going to take a lot longer for that digestion period. It's not like it's not going to happen, but it's probably not going to happen in two weeks. And if you do it above 125 degrees, 
you're, you're getting it too hot. You, have, you run the risk of losing some of your constituents, right? Um, and changing some of those constituents. So you don't want it really to go above 125 degrees for very long. So you do this flash heat and then bring it back down to 125 degrees. And then what I do is keep it at 125 degrees that entire rest of the time it needs uh, to, so, to macerate for. Um, but I've had a lot more luck doing a crock pot or doing a double boiler for a day, letting all that water boil off. Now the other thing you're gonna do is once you strain your fresh herb, and you don't have to do this when you make a dry herb infused oil, but once you strain your fresh herb infused oil, you're gonna do what we call decanting. And so you strain that herb off into a nice clean jar. And once that herb, once your oil is full, um, fills your jar, you wanna put a piece of cheesecloth over the top, affix it with a rubber band, let it sit somewhere untouched uh, for 24 hours. That allows your water and your oil to separate. Your oil is lighter than your water. It'll float to the top. Your water and your sediment will float to the bottom. After that 24 hour period, very gently pour your oil off from your water. While you're doing this, you can watch the water line climb up the side of your jar. So once that water line starts to hit the lip, go ahead and put it down, put that cheesecloth back on, let it sit for 24 hours untouched, let that separation happen, and keep doing that decanting process as many times as you can until you feel you've gotten all of the water out of the oil. And then that way you ensure that you've actually taken the water, the oil, out from the water. Uh, would a mason jar with the, with the tanning type lid on it, would that... Would you want cheesecloth over the top because that allows it to evaporate. No, I mean for, for, your, for your body better. Yeah. That would, that would be, wouldn't, you wouldn't have any harmful effects from, from using... For the canning jar on the top? Yeah. No. Okay. No. And then the other, the other question is, and I know it's not herbal, uh, my sister likes uh, emu oil. And so I'm thinking that I want to do one with emu yeah. oil. Yeah, totally fine. It would work. It would yeah. Work. I think there's like an emu farm in like Vashon or something. You might even be able to get local emu oil. <laughs> you, never, you never know. I don't know. I don't even know how they get the oil out of the emus. And you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> when you're whipping and you're using the mix or something, can you use those beers for other things? There? You can. You're not, you know, if you've made a body butter that contains some beeswax into it, it might be a little bit more challenging. You have just have to be really diligent about getting it clean. <coughs> Um, you can use um, Everclear, diluted in a little bit of water, that or rubbing alcohol actually works too, to clean off the beaters and that'll get all that beeswax residue off. So it should be fine. If you're making one like I did today with just cocoa butter and oil, totally fine. You're not going to have a problem with getting that off. Can you repeat that? What was, what was it you used to get off the beater? So you could use rubbing alcohol, you could use Everclear. What is Everclear? Everclear is just 100% ethanol. It's oh. just high proof alcohol. Um, you know, vodka is just not high enough. Any, anything, you know, that's like in the 50% alcohol range is just not high enough to actually get the, that thick resin off. I've had good luck um, sticking it in the oven and letting it warm up a little bit and then wiping it off. Yeah, and that would work too. So if, you know, you weren't, didn't do your dill diligence and wiped everything out and still had something on there. You could, even with your cheese grater, you could do that. Put it in the oven, let some of the, be, you know, because after a time it gets coated and then it's not grating anymore. So you could put it in the oven on a cookie sheet and let it kind of melt off and then it kind of is self-cleaning that way a little bit. So for a very first time of making any of this without buying a whole range of stuff, what would you recommend starting with? So most of the things that you need to make uh, your preparations are simple kitchen items. Um, and if you want, you can go ahead and email me and I'll send you my kitchen list of things that you definitely want to make sure you have on hand. Uh, a strainer that's got a nice fine mesh to it is what you're looking for to strain your preparations. Um, and cheesecloth, good organic non-bleach cheesecloth because most of the preparations that have to soak for a period of time, you're going to have to press it out. And so a good cheesecloth is gonna be good. But you'll notice I just simply used two pots. I didn't even need a stove. I had a couple you know, hot plates. I've got some measuring cups. Um, 
my favorite medicine make the chopstick. So if you love to get takeout from Chinese Thai rest, like save the chopsticks because I use this for everything, right? Um, uh, my coffee grinder, I use for coffee and I use as my herb grinder. And all I do is run white rice in between uh, using it and it completely cleans it out so that my coffee doesn't taste like my herbs and my herbs don't taste like my coffee. So you don't even need a separate grinder. I do have a separate blender for making my creams and everything because with my cream recipes I have beeswax in there and you just you're just not ever really getting all of the stuff out of there so I have a separate food blender from my medicine making blender but everything else is just going to be home stuff that you would normally use for cooking measuring spoons measuring cups you know pots pans bowls um, I have a very large collection of jars <laughs> I actually collect way too many jars, but um, jars, good canning jars work really well. Labels, you want to make sure you label, like I said, label everything so that you know how long it's been there, what's in it, what it is. Does that feel good? Well, I guess also, you know, you start looking at buying lots of the essential oils and the different, you know, shea butter versus whatever. I guess, again, kind of looking for basic what, what to start with. I don't want to buy 10 different things when I've never made it the first time. So you would want to just follow a good recipe. Um, you know, it all really just depends on your recipe. So good resources for good recipes would be Rosemary Gladstar's Family Herbal, one of the better, just great herb books to have in your home. She tells you how to make a number of different preparations. She gives you recipes for making a number of different preparations that are based off of calm and family illnesses. Can you if, the I sure can. If you want to make your own body care uh, preparations, uh, Stephanie Turles' book, Organic Body Care Recipes, is a great book. That's basically like, hey, what do you have that's slightly going bad in a refrigerator? Let's make a mask with it. Like, it's awesome. Um, If you really want to look into starting to make your own herbal medicinals, a must-have is James Green's The um, Herbal Medicine Maker's Book. This is the one that I require my students to purchase. Do you have a black marker? We can't no, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> But you can come up after and you can come look at it. Okay. Um, what I love about James Green's book is he really doesn't go into a lot of what herbs to use, but he goes into this is how you make all of these different preparations. He's very funny, so it's actually a very good read. Like he's really charismatic. And um, it's the book that I started with. And I find to be really good about explaining, well, why are you using the ingredients that you're using in these preparations? How would you use these preparations? How would you make these preparations? I do recommend when you're using his book, because he works in industry, um, he's one of the founders of Traditional Medicinals. He runs the California School of Herbal Studies. He actually, his recipes are pretty big. So I have all his recipes. Because when you're first making a recipe, you don't want to waste a bunch of ingredients if it goes wrong on you. Um, but he's got a great book as well. So really it kind of just depends on the recipes that you're making and what you'll need in your kitchen. So, so can you suggest, because Christmas is pretty close, it it's is. probably not time to go on the internet and order things. Is there somewhere around here where you can go get the oils, the butters? Yes. Um, that's a really good question. Um, most of the places that I like to go get my herbs and most of my medicine making equipment would be any of the herb stores. So there is the Herbalist on 45th.
There is Rainbow Remedy is up on 15th. There's Sugar Pill Apothecary, where I work two days a week up on Capitol Hill. We have herbs, but we really don't have bulk oils and stuff like that. Uh, Sugar Pill Apothecary. Uh, there's Dandelion Botanical in Ballard. I love that. That's where I teach my community classes. I love Dandelion in there. Yeah. How about in the east side? There's Urban Wellness, which I was just going to say in Kirkland. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic place. How about the South End? Um, not sure about the South End. North. Uh, north. You're the the one on Roosevelt is going to be your closest bet for North End. Yeah. The, um, for your for your you know bulk butters and stuff like that. I just I buy all my stuff through Mountain Rose Herbs, so I'm not sure where to get. Does any Does anybody have a good source for like bulk cocoa butter or bulk Shea butter that they're getting in this area. If you want to try Bellingham, oh. Ocean Soap. Oh, okay. What was it called? Ocean Soap. Ocean Soap in Bellingham. If you want to try. They may try. They may. They also may ship it to you, and you know, typically now you can get one or two day shipping. And you said there was an herbal shop on Roosevelt in the north. Yes. So it's where? called the Herbalist, and it's on Forty Fifth. No, it's on 60, 65th, 65th, thank you. 65th, not 45th. <laughs> we're on 45th, where we were. So a couple more questions and then it's gonna be time to end. Could you give a quick rundown on creams and vapor rubs? You mentioned them. Yeah, that's a whole different class. There is no quick rundown on how to do that, sorry. Yeah, if you wanna learn how to make that, definitely you can book me to do a private lesson or you can come to one of my community classes. But that's like a full two hour class, so. Do you have a schedule for your community classes? Um, I will be setting up my schedule for spring in the net, uh, within the month of December. So it should be coming up fairly quickly. And is that the... Uh the, uh, on the, on the yeah, panel. so if you go to my website, which is www.green-blessings.com, and that's on the bottom of your handout and on my card, I will have all of my community class listings. Do you have more cards? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> So in this lip balm, I believe it's sweet or it's sweet orange and lemongrass, which is one of my favorite combinations for lip balms. I really love that combination. And lemongrass for the lip balm. Thank you everybody so much for coming. Oh. Happy medicine making. <laughs>